Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. And this is episode number 348. That's episode number 348. What's up? What's going on? How are you doing? Good. Great. How am I? You know, same old, same old, kicking it. I'm glad that you could join me on this nice sunny day as we approach the weekend. I'm sure some of you weekend warriors are... No, I can't say you're looking forward to it, it? Do weekend warriors look forward to the weekend anymore now? Or now with COVID and lockdowns, do you actually look forward to it? I don't know. Is it the same? I'd imagine most people are just drinking their way through the week or getting smashed during the week or just not doing anything during the week so that when the weekend comes out, it's just another day. I'd imagine so, right? The lockdown kind of feels like, you know, when you go on holiday and the weekend doesn't really mean anything because you're just going on holiday and you just the days are the, what's important. That's what it sort of feels like during being in lockdown. You're in a constant holiday that you just can't go home from. You know, sometimes, imagine if you went to Mykonos, right? Or you went to Fort Mentera, or you went to, I don't know, um, Prague. Prague's not a good example because it's too small. But you know those kind of countries that, you know, people go to for their summer holidays. And um, it's usually pretty nice, right? Even Ibiza is a good example, right? Ibiza, right, is a good example. You go there, you have a good time, but then you are not, you're not allowed to go back home. It, it was going to get really boring really quickly. And this is sort of what's happening with us in lockdown. I'd imagine so. Everyone had, I did, I had fucking plans for lockdown, didn't I? I had some big, big, big plans what I was going to do. But, you know, you start staring at the same four walls. You start reading the same books. You're reading the same articles everyone else is reading. You're getting outraged about the same things everyone else is getting outraged about. And you're like, you know what, I've had enough. So nowadays, I'm just spending most of my time watching mad movies. I watched The uh, Usual Suspects, I said the other day. I watched 1917. Um, what else did I watch? I watched Heat. I've been watching loads of like movies I haven't watched or haven't got around to watching and just been banging those out because what else is there to do really? What else is there to do? Anyways, um, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure. I've got a jam-packed action show for you. Loads of interesting stuff to go and talk about. Things regarding the Northwest lockdown in the UK. So if you're up there, I um, my thoughts and feelings go out to you because you've been locked down again for a second time. So it's going to be a bit excruciating, especially given the 24-hour notice. We've got stuff <coughs> and developments regarding the clubbing landscape. There's, they've managed to secure funding in order to kind of cover them maybe for the rest of the year and some other good bits and bobs to get through. If it's your first time watching the show and you like what you hear, make sure to, if you want to support, you smash that like button, hit subscribe down below and leave me a comment. If you want to support the show, you can do too. Make sure you click that Patreon link. You can support the show for as little as $1 a month. Little as $1 a month. You can support it on Patreon. Click the link down below. You'll be able to also get um, the podcast in audio format completely for two days or sometimes three days in advance from it going out on YouTube. So if you want that, make sure you click that link below, down below in the description, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino, spelled A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Click that link, subscribe to the podcast via Patreon, and you can get that audio podcast a few days earlier than anybody else. Anyway, apart from all that, let's get into the show. Let's dive on deep. Let's go with it. Let's swing in there, do the damn thing, and keep it moving. So, Number one thing to get into, a bit of sad news actually, um, RIP to the boss man that is Herman Cain. Um, Herman Cain passed away unfortunately um, due to coronavirus. Well, we're not sure if it's coronavirus because, you know, the stats with corona are weird, isn't it? Um, when somebody, um, I think Elon Musk mentioned it on Joe Rogan, but they've been doing it a lot in America. I don't know why, but if somebody has preconditioned, if someone has a pre-existing condition that makes them susceptible to COVID, but they get COVID and then they pass away, they just file it as a covid death now i'm not too sure if that's the kind of first preliminary sort of um you know uh conclusion they come to when they have to just you know maybe because they have to get the bodies out of the hospitals and move them to the morgues and then they're going to then have a second round of checks again i'm not too sure but they are tending to do that quite often and the thing about herman Cain that makes it a bit more complicated to say he just died from covid is the fact that he was a uh, i'm pretty sure he, he he recovered from stage four cancer or something colon cancer which is one of the worst ones so um he was always susceptible to passing away um with any kind of new disease that he was unfortunately kind of contracted and he, he did so over the last few days but to say it was a covid death might be a bit unfair but it's sad news isn't it i don't you know he might have been a bit of a doof regarding covid and he didn't really you know take the necessary precautions but it's still sad that when someone passes away 
um, unnecessarily due to a virus that they, you know, we never knew existed prior to January. It is a really sad um, day, but for if you go on the uh, social media and you check on your feed, the people that are commenting on it are bloody gloating at the fact that he passed away. Some people are actually hoping that other people in the room who were there, m most notably maybe Trump, they're also hoping that he contracts it, which is really, really bizarre. But this article kind of basically speaks on it. And it's a bit of a tragic story regardless, isn't it? 74 is no age to die from coronavirus. It's no age to die in general, especially if you're a politician that's living the high life in it you should be um you know living way into your 90 into your 80s if a 90s so he had a lot of life to live really in that extent but this is from newsweek it's news max sorry it says um herman kane dies from coronavirus age 74 um the article is the following um, Herman Cain, the maverick American business star and Republican president can candidate, oh yeah, I remember that, who campaigned for a sweeping tax reform plan called 999, died Thursday morning after a month-long battle with coronavirus. He was 74. Cain, who recently joined Newsmax TV, was set to launch a weekly show, died in an Atlanta area hospital where he had been critically ill for several weeks. God almighty. He was admitted on July 1st, two days after being diagnosed with the COVID-19, 10 days before Cain had attended a rally for President Trump's... Um, uh, at the Tulsa, Oklahoma, but it's not known for sure where Kane or co-chairman for the Black Voice of Trump was in, infected. He has been withdrawn on. He has been on whirlwind travel schedule in June, stopping in multiple cities. Now that's the issue they have in there, isn't it? We're having the issue here too, actually in the UK. The lack of track and trace <coughs> is really affecting people because you have no idea where you contacted the virus. There's no way for the authorities to contact the people that might have come in contact with you when you're at that place. It's a complete shit show, really, for the, for the sake for that, um, when you look at it that way. And I don't know how they want to deal with it. I'm not sure if the Americans just want to think, you know, they're just kind of hoping it kind of goes away by itself, which makes sense if you listen to what Trump said, right? He was, he's, gonna, he's kind of hoping it kind of washes away um, or kind of, you know, just decimates the population of the United States, whoever's left is left. Uh, whoever's left are the anointed chosen ones. I don't know, but bloody hell, man. It's bloody concerning to look at from the outside. It continues here, it says, um, he was one of the most original thinkers in American politics, veteran politician consultant, Dick Morris told Newsmax, noting um, he was creative, uh, had strong conviction and an open mind and a deep sense of patriotism. And um, he was a great friend and a great guy. Sadly, um, the plague strikes home. Cain was a self-made man with an extraordinary backstory, one that made him a uh, towering example of hard work paying off. He was born December 13th, 1944 in Mississippi, Tennessee, and grew up poor in Atlanta, Georgia, where his father worked three jobs as a janitor, barber, and, and chauffeur, while his mother toiled as a domestic worker. A stellar student who worked hard, Cain graduated from Morehouse College with a mathematics degree um, in 1967. A year later, he married um, Gloria Etchinson, Etchinson, whom he met when he was a sophomore at Morehouse, and he and she was a freshman at Morris College, Morris Brown College. Um, Kane went on to earn a master's degree in computer science from the Pur Purdue University in 1971. Helped develop fire control ballistics for ships and fire ships for the U U.S. Navy. Bloody hell! Next, he joined the Coca-Cola Company as a systems analyst, and after considerable success, moved to Philsbury. Uh, this is the thing you don't really hear about people like this, right? I guess because he's well, because I guess because he's a Republican and he he, he was a staunch trump um defender and supporter right co-chair of the black voices for trump which is already an incredibly gay thing to be a part of right any kind of group any kind of um group that you have a name and you come together and you do some weird handshake and you fly behind a banner it's just completely gay but hey you gotta do what you have to do but he's got quite an interesting story right but i guess because he you know he advanced in his age and he become, you know, I guess if something happens when you when you're a politician and you get a bit older, you tend to lean into your, you tend to lean a bit more to the conservative side of things. You start to become a bit grumpy. You start to become risk averse. Maybe that's the thing that happens, or maybe it's just part of his personality. But you don't hear any of these stories about his sort of like you know climb up because it's really inspiring, really, if you think about it. Um, it continues it. It says after serving as a regional vice president for Pillsbury Burger King, um, Kane then took on the biggest challenge of his career as president and CEO of Godfather Pizza, a national chain um, teaching on the age of bankruptcy. In 14 months, he returned Godfather to profitability and led his management team to a buyout of the company. Wow. Later, Kane said he could explain his success at Godfather in one word: marketing. Kane, who, lo who long held an interest in public policy, became a chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City, Omaha Beach, Omaha Branch, sorry, in 1955. 
and serving in a position for 20 months. In 2019, Trump nominated Kane to seat at the Federal Reserve Board, but the nomination drew serious flack from Congress and Kane detractors. Because I ran as a Republican for President and the United States Senate, I bec and because I am an outspoken voice of conservatism and an outspoken voice of constitutional and the laws, I'm being attacked, Kane said, shortly before asking the President to withdraw his nomination. Kane first dabbling into politics came in 1966 when he was tapped as a senior advisor to the Dole and Kemp presidential campaign. He ran for Senate seat in Georgia in 2004 that was defeated in the Republican primary by John Isaacson. In 2016, Kane was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer, but with the aggressive treatment, was able to beat the disease. In his book, This is Herman Kane, he discusses life-threatening illness writing. It's been more than six years since then, and guess what? I'm completely cancer-free, cured. Well, why was I spared against the odds? God said, not yet. So yeah, he lived a full life, man. Like, RIP to him, but some of the vitriol he's getting online just, it goes to show you just how mean and toxic social media has got in some regards, right? You don't like some of these political views. He passes away due to his own negligence, don't get me wrong, but just extend some courtesy. Wish him, you know, wish him, um, wish his and his family good wishes. Yeah, send, you know, cond send condolences to his, him and his family and, you know, just send him on his way. Um, but kind of rejoicing in someone's death is super super bizarre i've never really understood that kind of way of thinking but hey i guess that is what you get when you mess with politics isn't it next on the list what else do we have here to talk about we have oh did i speak about this already right an update did i talk about the entitlement of people going on a holiday during coronavirus i think i did but if i didn't i'm gonna go over it again um been thinking about it a bit you know over the last few weeks because i guess what's happened is that because all the other things have started to open up and we're allowed to go outside, I think people have started to kind of desire and need the things that they've been used to or accustomed to prior to COVID, which is natural, right? It only makes sense that people will be like, you know what, I've had enough of this. I want to go on holiday because you're able to go to shops, you're able to go to pubs, you're able to go to restaurants. So that was a probably the in in the kind of, in hindsight, that was the area of, era of the government. The government maybe opened up the economy too quickly because they were scared that it, it would completely tank and they had no plan in place to uh, buffer the industries, to give them some sort of funding. They probably just didn't have the money really in, in that respect, which kind of leads you to uh, ask the question, where is that money that we pay in taxes? Where does that go if they don't have it to hand to bail out some uh, core businesses that are fundamental to our overall infrastructure as a country, to our overall um, nationwide uh, GDP? So I guess some people will just be like, you know what, if everything is going tits up here, especially when we started to get some good reports about stuff happening in Europe, especially this was prior to the spike we see now in Spain, people are like, you know what, I'm actually just going to go. I'm actually just going to go on holiday because our country is a complete shit show. I need to get a tan. I need to get away from stuff and just disconnect and you go and do that. No problem. But then I was under the false impression that people were also aware and conscious of the idea that if you do decide to go on holiday, you are going at your own risk, right? You're not going with the assurances that everything is going to remain the same when you leave or everything's going to remain the same when you come back. There's going to maybe there's going to be some changes in policy. You might have to quarantine for a bit longer. Flights might get delayed. You might have to stay in a destination you're at. I think we all what did you watch that video, that documentary on Vice about the last festival on earth? Um, I think it took place somewhere, I'm going to say in Central America. Um, Vice flew out there and essentially interviewed guests of a festival that I think took place, I'm going to say at the start of the year, around January, February, and it kind of ran, kind of bled into March, And but they didn't have any way of coming, or sorry, they didn't have any way of leaving that festival because that's when kind of, you know, COVID was spreading rapidly across, you know, South America, Central America, North America. So any departing trips um, were basically cancelled, uh, planes were grounded, and I'm assuming the countries that these guys were from whether it was from north america or the united states were not kind of welcoming any planes from those um quote-unquote third world countries because they didn't want to risk you know an outbreak in their nation via a small group of people but when you watch that documentary what you come away thinking of it is that yeah these guys you know they you have sympathy for them because they left for this festival and COVID wasn't a thing yet in the Western world. And then when they were ready to come back home, suddenly everything had been changed and the world had, the world had gone upside down due to something they had no idea even was, you know, a thing, right? But nowadays, you'd imagine if you're going to go to Greece now, you're going to go to Spain now, you are le as legitimately going, Portugal, France, you're legitimately going under the impression that you are taking some level of risk and you're taking the risk upon yourself. You can't then complain when the government turn around and change the regulations, but people do. And this kind of article from uh, BBC kind of proves the fact, right? It says here, yeah, coronavirus, 
Um, we've paid for a Spain trip, so we may as well go, right? And you see a group of lovely young ladies here straddling their bags on the way to their holiday to get a tan and to chill out, I imagine. It says the following. It says, um, the government has warned against non-essential travel to Spain following a rise in coronavirus cases. The announcement early this week that people returning to the UK from Spain will be required to quarantine for 14 days left holiday makers with a dilemma. Should they follow the safety advice and so script, um the holiday they've spent months looking forward to, or should they go ahead and travel anyway despite the potential health risk and the prospect of inv uh, invalidating their travel insurance at east midlands airports there appear to be plenty of people in the latter camp now the issue i have with this that statement is that you haven't been planning your trip for months i kind of pour scorn over that and i think they're chatting out of their ass i think that's bullshit most people that are booking their holidays have only booked them within the last month or so if that or last couple of weeks most of your summer holidays you've had planned out you've effectively given them up i had a summer holiday planned for what berlin to go to go berlin for may day that was what a couple of months ago we would have been there for maybe the end of my birthday weekend it would have then bled into may day then we would have spent another extra week in berlin you know exploring having fun doing a whole having fun i always sound like jordan woods when i said it, it? we're in la just having fun you know friends being young um that was a legendary video but anyway um so that was the plan right and then that got scrapped quite soon Man, no, that, that got that got scrapped quite early. That got scrapped maybe in February. I got a note from Ryanair basically saying that that trip wasn't happening, right? That plane, would, that flight had been cancelled. And then quite soon after that, I got a voucher link and, you know, everything's been sorted out. No trouble there. No um, no sweat off my brow. You know, I would have liked to go, but, you know, Germany's, Germany's cases are going up. Our cases are going up. It is what it is. But most people that are booking now, they're definitely booked within the last week or so. I don't think they can lie. Don't lie and say you booked it months ago. You didn't. You booked in the last week or so and then things happen to change, which is okay. But you can't then turn around and say oh the government owe us an explanation no they don't man have you seen how they've cocked it up royally right they cocked it up with the announcement um this over 24 hours you know basically telling you into quarantine for two weeks if you come back from spain they cocked it up by telling people in the northeast uh, of england if you um that you're gonna go under lockdown especially with eid coming around that's gonna cause complete pandemonium they didn't really detail the uh, the plans in place for restaurants and bars and stuff so the government aren't to be trusted right you're not supposed to just listen to everything they say because they dealt with it pretty shitly you're meant to just read between the lines and kind of take stock of what's happening in society globally right maybe domestically and then make an informed decision based on the information that you have but to wait and sit around and hope that the government point you in the right direction is really naive anyway article continues it says plane is more dangerous than spain uh, this guy, Adam Spinos from Long Eaton, Derbyshire, who's flying from East Midlands Airport to Ibiza, said he was more worried about being on the plane than he was at his destination, which is bullshit because most of the time from the topics or subjects I've read through, the plane's actually the safest place to be to the beat. The planes are one of the safest place to be on if you're going to be indoors because they recycle the air really well. He continued to said, I've checked everything that's happening over there and the situation and it's fine. I just want to see how the plane goes and the precaution staff take so people don't get too drunk and behave, which will make me more confident. Confident. Now, if I don't think airplanes are giving out, are serving alcohol on, on flights, I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, that's already, that's always been a pain I've heard people going on flights from the, you know, from anywhere in the UK to places like I'd be for the people get absolutely levered on a plane, you know, all drink drinks and stuff. I've never done that. Actually. I've never actually had a, an alcoholic beverage on a short haul flight. I've always maybe had one if I'm going somewhere in the States, Southeast Asia, South America, cool. But I've never had a need to grab a beer on a plane. I'm just, I, I'd rather go to an actual pub when I land there and actually, you know, soak up the scenery and the environment and have an actual cold brew when I land as, as opposed to like some warm thing, um, you know, at God knows what altitude. It continues here. It says, Mr. Spinner said he decided to continue his holiday as he had never been to Ibiza. I just want to experience it with caution, of course, and the sun and the beach just relax a little bit and we have promised ourselves a mojito fair enough isn't it on tuesday airline jet 2 cancelled all five of its departing flights on the airport to spanish destination and said it was contacting customers aboard to discuss options about returning bloody hell that's a mad one and then this is the girl that kind of smashed it right i'm entitled to travel she's she's even got the entitled face isn't it like uh, uh shana lil shana lily or shana lil shana lil from sheffield said she was itching to get away to ibiza i'm excited she said i'm a traveler and she'd be in a different country every single month but i haven't been anywhere since last year um, so I'll stick to the guidelines and wear my mask where I where I have to wear them so I'm doing everything I just feel that I am entitled to have a tr I mean I'm entitled no it's just it I just feel that I have the entitlement to travel and I will travel God almighty 
I guess you could change that sentence and say, I have the permission to travel, right? And until they, because that's fair, isn't it? Until the laws change and say that you can't travel at all, you are within your right to travel, right? No one's saying you shouldn't, but it probably would be safer for you not to do so, right? It's still, isn't it the same thing, I guess, with condoms, right? It's not illegal not to use a condom, but if you want to, you know, make sure you don't, and you don't kind of, uh, what you call, accidentally impregnate somebody, it probably is best that you do use a condom. So the same would go with COVID and traveling. Like, you know, if you want to minimize your susceptibility to catching COVID, you're probably better off not traveling hundreds of miles away to get a tan and just doing it in a local park. The weather in the UK has been pretty good, isn't it, this summer? Don't get me wrong. It's going to get worse. I think people's mood is going to really crash when the winter comes around. Um, I'm sure of that. But nowadays, you can probably get away with getting a bit of a tan outdoors in the parks. I'm sure those of tanning salons are probably, you know... Um, itching for a bit of business you could probably go there and get one too and if all else fails get a bit of a spray tan you know bob's your uncle going as your aunt it continues here says the travel trade association abta said the fco advice is issued for good reason and for travelers need to be aware of their travel insurance will be invalid spokesman and um, jonathan smith said he wouldn't advise that people go against the foreign office travel advice but flights are still operating and people that do choose to go should be aware of the risk involved exactly that's it people are t they're basically telling you don't go but obviously they can't tell you not to to go because the planes are still departing but if you do go be aware of the risk and be aware that things can things can change this guy says we've paid it we've paid for it so we may as well go um kieran brooks from liverpool um also taking a ryanair flight to abifa said he understood the advice but was willing to take the risk good boy he said we have booked it and we we have booked it all and we have paid for it um so we might as well go for a few days obviously the insurance is invalid if the foreign office say you can't go but we are only going for a few days so we're going to go and hope for the best it's only the advice at the end of the day so if you choose not to listen to advice that's your decision exactly but i'm not surprised people get that much do you get insurance when you go on holiday that often i've never got insurance i may be apart from when i went to nicaragua or something but i've never actively sought to get any travel insurance i just always wing it and take the risk um i'm sure that's probably going to bite me in the butt sooner rather than later but so far so so far so good touch wood in it continues here last minute decision um samantha lily from birmingham said her decision to go ahead with the trip was made at 11th hour she said i don't think i was going until about two weeks ago which most people she, she's being honest most people are doing that everyone else saying uh, months ago i booked my holiday they're lying um I don't think um, so I didn't think I was going on until about two weeks ago uh, when I thought, yeah, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go. Uh, what you get? I'm hoping it's going to be a bit more quiet. Probably not. So it'll be easier for us to stay away from everybody. She says, I'm going to work as well. So it's going to be a bit nerve wracking. So, yeah, um, fair enough to everyone going, man. Isn't it? I'm a bit jealous. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to go on holiday myself, but I'm a bit of a P-U-S-S-Y when it comes to these sort of things. Um, I have already my pre-existing pre conditions with my asthma that I probably can't take any chances with. But if I had the option to and I could go, I would. But I'll also accept the responsibility. I wouldn't be complaining online and be, oh, the government changed the rules. So now if I go everything's gonna be destroyed it's like grow up right grow up um but that being said right in terms of taking risk how risk adverse are you because i've heard through the grapevine or i actually got an email the other day via a party a party promotion here in the uk or specifically here in london that i used to attend that basically sent me a, a, a list of dates that they're looking at putting together some functions and some parties, right? Some, you know, friends and family parties where you basically buy a ticket. Um, they put your details down for track and trace. And, you know, you can't basically talk about it online. You can't post any pictures, but they're going to put together a little rave in an abandoned warehouse somewhere. Would you go? Would you? Because I'm considering, right? Because I'm thinking to myself, it would be good to have a bit of a dance amongst some strangers, grab a couple of drinks, have a bit of a boogie, get sweaty and come back home. But I'm also keenly aware that COVID thrives in such environments, right? Close proximity, not much ventilation, people shouting and screaming, um, you know, just the, the absolute breeding ground for COVID to spread and for people to uh, catch it. So should I go just for a bit? pop in pop out or should i just abstain i'm thinking i'm gonna probably abstain but it's quite interesting to see because this pipe promotion i'm talking about or these promoters i'm talking about they're not exactly the most um cavalier cowboy operation they do tend to do stuff they do tend to do things a little bit more by the book so if they're doing a party i'd imagine what all the other kind of renegades out there just have you know uh, a portable uh pa system are doing 
they're probably throwing mad events at the moment and i think that's going on all the time so that's quite interesting to kind of think about all these events popping off and maybe it kind of illustrates what i've kind of read on here that basically the is it the world health organization they're essentially blaming young people for the spread of covid they're saying that young people's excess young people are the ones that are probably driving the rates in cases because they're all mostly are asymptomatic no symptoms and then they're passing it around because they're gathering around in big groups not social distancing and all that malarkey i think it's from sky news isn't this one yeah it's just sky news so it's just from sky news it says the following coronavirus are young people to blame for a new rise in covid19 cases Ooh, would i say i'm a young person i guess so am i a young person um, if you're a millennial you're a young person isn't it? yeah i'm a young person um it continues it says the world health organization has warned that young people could be driving spikes in coronavirus across the europe um with the continent said to be on the edge of a second wave organizations europe director said that a higher proportion of new cases are being seen among the young but is that the case in the uk and if there are higher rates among the young especially when it's documented that on the whole young people are less affected by covid is that a cause for concern dr hyde klunk did not go into pacific countries when he told the bbc radio 4 program on wednesday an increasing number of countries are experiencing localized outbreaks and a resurge in the case is consequence of a change in human behavior we're receiving reports from several health authorities of a higher proportion of new infections among young people so for me the call is loud enough to rethink how to better develop so to better involve younger people so that's sure it, it makes more sense because i'd imagine right with just people being so bored at home and having nothing to do especially the young people they're the ones suffering the most right because you're, you're we're probably we've probably never had any it depends maybe if you're from spain or you're from italy or you're from maybe those kind of countries you might have suffered some kind of economical downturn during your lifetime right uh, the economy crashed um there was a scandal in parliament that affected finances and jobs prospects and stuff right but for the most part in the uk we haven't really had to suffer from this right um maybe it's localized too maybe if you were in new york during the you know the, during the during 9 11 you probably suffered something in the wake of this but being locked in your home with no kind of you know insight career prospects and you know dwindling finances and friends falling left right and center it's definitely going to make you want to just break out and just go outside and say you know what eff it let me just um kind of risk what i need to risk but i need to get out there and socialize i'd imagine so or just being bored at home in it um quite honestly it continues here it says his warning comes at a time of increased concern about the risk of communities being inf reinfected by people returning from holiday hotspots some of which have been accused of observing less social distancing than might be seen at home and also reports of post-lockdown street parties and raves blood i didn't i didn't even think about that you know bro Imagine everyone going away on a holiday, actively going away, like whole streets, whole communities, whole household, whole friendship groups, and then coming back to their communities. They're, people are going to be shaking in their boots like, God almighty. I'd imagine, you be, would you be quite pissed off if all your neighbors decided to swan off to a holiday and you're just, you decided to kind of abide by the rules and kind of, you know, lock down in place? And then they all come back in and they, they all came back home and didn't observe quarantine. That would really piss you off, innit? I'd imagine so. Um, that must be really distressing, innit? God damn it, man. That's just, that's why we failed so badly in the West with COVID, innit? If you look at places like Southeast Asia, especially in Vietnam, right, there was that kind of sense of civic responsibility. Everyone sort of gathered around, knuckled in, um, you know, and sort of like decided, hey, for the greater good, because we all want to get back to some levels of normality, let's all kind of abide by the rules. Maybe they've imagine maybe they've got a government or society in place that makes them a little bit more, you know, susceptible to going with instructions and not kind of questioning anything but still man oh how well they dealt with it but you can't say that about new zealand can you new zealand i would i would imagine is the most um religious of countries or the most tyrannical of countries really right um but anyway continue to say, so the european center of disease prevention and control which collates the data about the coronavirus infection rates across the uk has patchy information about the rising rates amongst different age groups so interesting article regardless anyway it's a bit of a long one i'll link it down below if you check out but it does make a lot of sense in it that they the especially in the us you would imagine so especially with the riots and the protest and the demonstrations there's been a lot of people outdoors in the U in um in the u.s maybe less so more so than the uk of course population wise but we had a bit of a spurt with the black lives matter kind of protests a few weeks or a couple of months ago during the week was there was a couple of months ago maybe a month ago so time has gone by so quickly but that's the issue you're having in it loads of young people going out not really caring 
um, catching the catching the virus and then coming back and especially passing it to people who are you know on the wrong end of getting it really in that respect. But Jesus, man, God Almighty, God Almighty. Next on the list, what else do we have here to talk about? Oh, this is a bit of a funny one, isn't it? This is from the Metro. Metro have got one of the worst sites in the world. It kind of reminds me of the Daily Mail, isn't it? The amount of ads. They don't allow you to view the... Metro is one of those, like the Daily Mail. They don't allow you to view the site um, unless you um, unless you disable ad block. But they've got tons of ads. Ads on a banner, ads on the sidebar, <coughs> ads in the actual copy of the... you know, Ads that, to break up the actual copy. Like copy, what, copy breakers, or whatever they're called, paragraph breakers. That ads as well. Pop-up videos. Um, f- oh, just insane the amount of data they're pulling from me but this is a funny interesting story regarding huge queue for tests after an outbreak at a pub where 200 people crowded into the beer garden 200 now I suppose we're reading the comments I've heard that this pub is a bit of a shit show anyway um it's known as a bit of a you know it's known to attract the more let's say um cavalier or reckless of patrons in there so it's not the most sophisticated of bars but it's just a funny story nonetheless isn't it um i'm gonna read a bit of it because my screen is still loading and being an absolute b-i-t-c-h about this whole issue but it says following it says an emergency testing center has been set up near a pub after 10 uh drinkers caught coronavirus bloody hell the outbreak is believed to have spread after around 200 people crammed like sardines into a beer garden of the crown and archer pub in stone uh, staffordshire all those who visited the pub between the 15th uh 16th of july and the 18th are being urged to get themselves uh tested as soon as possible the man who raised the alarms about the lack of social distancing in the garden has welcomed the measure um aaron robinson 31 lives opposite and posted a video showing the crowds which went viral bloody hell man one person was it 10 people got it in a pub that's the thing i never understood about the rules that they put in place in the uk open the pubs but then allow people to sit indoors why i'm a big proponent of restarting the economy especially hospitality i think the government really failed that sector in terms of so, so if, if you're going to close them all down and you're not going to allow them to open then at least allow them to have access to some kind of fund that can supplement their income supplement their, their, their loss of earnings allow them to kind of support their salary and not have to fire everybody that could be a good thing but they didn't do that cool so they want to reopen the hospitality sector i want to reopen pubs and bars so that they don't have an economy that kind of flatlines by this by the end of september i get it but allowing pubs to seat people indoors when you know that's going to spread covid was ridiculous i I always imagine especially from the designs i saw online of people kind of specking out what they think would work best in terms of uh the layouts i always assumed they were going to do something that was more similar or more akin to like a um i don't know like a what, what would you call them uh like a dive bar right minimal seating mostly standing up and just or if you have a pub just basically clearing all the tables and seats that allow people to stand if they want to right but that obviously minimizes the amount of people that are coming and maybe have a security guard at the front of the store at the front of the pub sorry that basically only allows a certain amount of people in there and kind of evenly space it out if you are going to do that but to allow people just to sit inside as per normal with one meter spacing only is insane especially when you consider we already had a bit of a habit i felt like in the uk people already built a bit of a habit where they were essentially going to the pub no they were going out buying drinks at shops and then hanging out at parks or going and sitting on some stoop somewhere on some street corner we already had that bit of, we already kind of um were kind of exercising that habit right building that habit up so for suddenly to then to switch and tell us to go back to pubs i wouldn't you know it's no it's no um fault of anybody's that you'd think oh okay it's kind of over i'm over i'm gonna go on holiday because that kind of obviously clicks into your head of thinking hold on if you're gonna restaurant if i can go to pub why can't i just get on an airplane it makes complete sense in that respect um this is the guy's video where he sort of takes a piss out of it i think i'm gonna play a little bit of it here hopefully my video is not kind of freezing here what does it say can you hear that is it playing or not no it's not is it playing no it's not go play please yeah, Metro website is the worst website in the world, hands down. There you go. Brilliant. <laughs> Don't you worry, Boris. I'll be wearing my face mask. Bloody us, while I'm in Morrison's that's buying a me packet of bacon. I'll wear my face mask. I'll save. I'll save the country. Don't you worry. I'll sort it. 
Trust in uh, a common sense of the nation. Uh, yeah, yeah, rather useless cretin. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good impression. I got to be honest. Bloody hell. Um, it continues here. It says, um, "What does it say here?" He told the Stoke um, Sentinel newspaper, "It's sensible that the council is acting and taking it seriously, but it's a shame that it's gone this far. I was very concerned by the amount of people who were there—at least 200. With a bit of luck, the virus won't spread too far and turn into a big outbreak. If we do, we'll go into a local lockdown, and the pub has to take a lot of answer. Has a lot to answer for. Exactly, man. Imagine how outraged you'll be in the local community if your local pub. That's already a bit of a shit show anyway. That attracts the most, you know, unsullied of representatives of your local community." you know where they have the music on too loud people are spilling out into the street shouting screaming antisocial behavior and then that is a pub that ends up causing an outbreak and ends up you having to go into a localized lockdown for an extended period of time you'd be absolutely fuming it continues said here the testing center has been set up in a car park close to the pub and tests are being offered for free with no appointments needed anyone who's been in contact with somebody who was at the pub is also being told that they should get a test those who were out anywhere in the town center and the night in question have, have since developed symptoms are being told to self-isolate dr richard halting of staffordshire derby county said by getting tested this gives everyone an important information that's the issue because i think that's what's happening in france right these open air parties i think i mentioned it prior right i'm gonna actually end the article because i'm absolutely making my computer freeze but i remember when i was when covid first spread and everyone was getting nervous about there won't be any nightclubs or being in events i was saying at the i was saying what would basically happen was that a lot of people were basically going to take advantage of the fact that covid doesn't spread in open air events and they're going to classify all the events as open air so what you do is that you just basically hire out a nightclub a, a space that had like a garden or something where you could set up a gazebo or a tent um to kind of cover people and then you'd essentially have the dj playing inside the room or maybe just on the doorsteps of that door and have people kind of flooding out on the outside it could you could pack people in you could obviously charge them double what they'd wanted to pray prior because you know it's a covid party and then you could get away with it being open air and obviously that would obviously cause a big outbreak i think a lot of people have kind of stayed away from it <clears throat> it feels like most patrons don't want to um be anywhere near it or be anywhere near big crowds but i thought that would be a thing that's going to happen quite often um so it's no surprise to see pubs doing the same thing you know kind of taking advantage of the fact that you can open up your gardens to get more people in because you know as much as i'm saying people shouldn't be inside the pubs i think still having your pub open with only one meter spacing in between you're not going to be able to make any money really yeah? so it makes sense that they're kind of trying their best to um uh make something work in that respect what else we have to talk about here? Let's move on, move on in, move on deep. Should we, let's let's change tax a bit and kind of get off the old COVID talk because that can get incredibly, incredibly boring after a while, isn't it? Let's get into some interesting topics regarding update on the whole um, Brendan Shaw, um, Brian Callan, the fire and the kid COVID positive test, I guess, right? Positive test, positive, positive whatever it won't been. So, interesting developments just regarding that whole team and what's basically going on there. It's just funny to see um, how, number one, they've reacted to it. Obviously, they haven't conducted themselves in the best way, especially Brendan. He sort of doubled down on this idea that it's not that big of a deal. If you get it, you'll be fine. And he doesn't necessarily see that the issue isn't you'll be fine, as in himself, because he's under the age of, you know, um, getting it where you'll die or anything, or he's a fit dude, whatever it may be. It's that you're going to get it and obviously spread it to people who are more um, susceptible to passing away from the virus or getting some some mad illness from it, right? So it just hasn't dealt with it in the right way. And I guess that alongside with the throwing Chris Alia under the bus and just generally being, you know, L.A., very LA-ish in the way they do things makes it, this clip really funny. Um, this is a clip from Legion of Skanks where they initiate where they, I think they're doing this like mock presidential debate between the four of them: Dave Smith, uh, Luis J. Gomez, Big J, and Ari Shafir, where they essentially kind of you know, kind of doing a mock the mock election, mock presidential election, and they hooked up Ari Shafir to a lie detector and asked him a very important question that I thought was extremely fun that elicited a very, very funny response in that respect. So we're going to put it up here on the screen and play. All right, next one. Okay, number three. Do you respect Brendan Schaub as a, crime, a comedian? <laughs> <laughs> can I trade this question no, for two more no, questions? No, no, you cannot. You said yes, and the lie detector test determined that was a lie. Wow! <laughs> Wow! Sorry. Oh, who's your friend? Which is okay. Let's to, <laughs> look at it. It cuts into it. <laughs> huh? 
just... <laughs> you know, it's like... It's a weird... Mate, the more you look back at it, right? How ridiculous was that scene of them crying? Like, of that podcast? How ridiculous was it? Like, sobbing in tears as if their friend is accused of being a serial killer or something. Like, relax. Relax, guys. Relax. That's why sometimes it's good to just take a breath, take a step back, and just kind of process the information. Especially, you'd imagine you'd be a little bit more considerate with your re response when it's your friend. You should be a little bit biased. You should be a little bit um forgiving a bit more understanding uh have a bit more patience because it's your friend right when you hear a story about some random person that you don't know doing something derogatory or doing something really abhorrent of course it's you're really right to be like oh cancel him he's trash he's trash because you don't know the person you have no context you're okay to do that that's what everyone does on social media that's what you'll do in private it is what it is you don't have any context you don't have a relationship with that person you could just throw them under the bus no one will give it's not even throw them under the bus you can just completely disparage them as a person and no one will bat an eyelid but when it's your friend you're meant to be a little bit more cautious you're meant to be a little bit more considerate and understanding and i don't know maybe call your friend find out exactly what happened speak to them face to face um withdraw from social so you don't get bombarded with requests to kind of make a response and then because when you do this is what you do you start sobbing and crying here like as if your friend has lost i don't know everything in the world don't get me wrong immediately short pain short-term pain he did receive i'm sure you know the embarrassment um the shame of it uh the exposure the dropping of the agents the cancelling of the netflix show fair enough some stuff did happen but in the long term let's relax let's take it easy but the first bit anyway of, of irish Rafir not wanting to answer the question regarding um him not respecting brendan Schulz as a comedian is funny because obviously it speaks upon the general friction that's at play between the east coast comics and the west coast comics it feels as if most of the kind of friction comes because the the west coast comics are usually in the business of stand-up and in the east coast feel like they're in the art of stand-up right they're the kind of dudes who are essentially you know in it for the art of it they, they kind of often refer to themselves as a comedian's comedian i think of somebody like a david tells a good example right where a lot of comedians sort of sing his praises and think he's the best but the wider public don't really know that because he hasn't necessarily put himself front and center he's not necessarily around all the hollywood elites he doesn't really necessarily play that game he just does a road does stand up and keeps it moving so that's a friction that comes in it but then brendan Shaw really kind of kind of upsets the apple cart because he essentially came into stand up via um, mma uh, via a professional mix, meant, uh, a professional career in the UFC, he came into it late too, in his early thirties, and he got kind of sped through his process, kind of far, you know, into the game via his co-sign with Joe Rogan, and all these things. But especially if you're a comedian, they already have their backs up when somebody gets a little um, advantage in the game via a kind of you know a chance meeting with an agent. So imagine how they're gonna feel when some ex. MMA fighter comes in and essentially kind of leapfrogs them, which I don't think he did, to be honest. I still think you can operate in the business of stand up and operate in the, in the artistry of stand up and you still kind of coexist. I, I think that's fine. They're, they're both two different worlds. I don't think people that are fans of Brendan Shaw would ever be fans of Legion of Scans, for instance, right? It's completely, completely, com two completely different sense. Uh, sense of comedy, right? What was that? What's that term? Sense of comedy. It's two different. It's two different ways of looking at stand up. I think in that regard, similar to those kids on TikTok or Instagram that do stand up or do kind of their improv comedy sketches. It's a completely different uh, type of comedy. Some that you know, I probably am not into, but I get its appeal. Let's continue the video. As I said to, to Brennan, I said it's like um, <laughs> you know, it's it's like watching someone die or something. But it isn't really, is it? Come on, relax. I am also surprised. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. Well, I mean, <laughs> he's just getting started. He's got a long career ahead of him. <laughs> he's only forty. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Ari's the best at these kind of moments, isn't it? Like, he has these moments where he's an absolute piece of shit, but when he needs to be, he's incredibly Here's, funny. I was pretty bad four years in, <laughs> and he's far better than I. He's <laughs> you, you didn't even finish the sentence, Ari. You couldn't even finish the sentence. Not hooked up to the lie detector He's better than test. I. Better than I. What? Man, you know what? He's more, whatever. He was more confident than I was at that. At that. Uh, stage and that's what's so frustrating it's i'm just sad yeah i'm sad i don't so anyway this is not gonna age well this video this is them sobbing this is just not gonna age. look at them <laughs> yeah sometimes that's the best thing to say is to say i don't know what to say this is insane I'm just, um, I don't know. i'm mad
Yeah. I think that's a, it's, I'm mad. I'm angry. Can't talk. Huh? I can't talk. Well, that's a problem. Oh, uh, this is insane. <laughs> you can just, you can just pray. Oh. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> because no matter what the facts are. Who's got a worse cry? Um, Brendan Shaw or Kim Kardashian? Who's got the worst one, you reckon? Oh. Whatever comes out, I'm as shocked as anyone, anyone else. I'm hurt. hurt. I'm mad. mad. I'm <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> I, 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 oh. okay, These tests four. are faulty a lot. I'm fucking mad, man. I'm mad at him. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> oh, I swear, even at the time when everyone was saying, I remember when it first came out and the clip, right? And I measured, trust, I'm not trying to be evil, but I remember in the comments, I was reading, I was thinking, each of comments, everyone's like, oh my God, they're so real, bless them. I was like, huh? This is bizarre. Why are they sobbing like this for? We haven't even got the whole story yet. It already seemed fishy from the onset, the whole Crystalia thing. I was like, mm, this doesn't really seem legit. Or if it does, they're probably uh, chucking way too many allegations at him at the same time. He probably is guilty of being an absolute dirtbag. He's absolutely guilty of treating girls like absolute dog shit, for sure. But let's relax with the P word. Let's relax with that. But nah, these guys threw him under the bus, started sobbing in public just to save their own career, basically, as well. Let's not, let's not, let's not kind of sugarcoat that one that wasn't for um um crystalia's sake that was mostly for their own but god damn it um it's interesting i'm interested to see how it's going to play out though this kind of divide because it seems like there is a real tension especially with the fact that these guys got covid and just kind of were cavalier about it and i'm sure some of the comics on the east coast are like why are they so desperate to go out to do stand-up anyway it's not as if they're any good at it apart from maybe brian callen they probably respect as a comic but they don't respect brendan so they're probably looking at it thinking why would you be battling and fighting to go out and do stand-up when you're not even that good right it's not as if people it's not as if you're like a dave Chappelle or a chris rock i'd imagine so but you know it's unfair to say that because you know that is his vocation that is something that he's dedicated for at least four years or five years of his life to and he obviously wants to pursue as a career so if he wants to go out then do the you do the stand-up and people are willing to go and pay their money and sit in a room and watch him do it fair enough but i don't know man i wish it could be because i think it's similar to what's happening in the dj world where there is a bit of a split between the people that would kind of consider themselves artists or that consider themselves um pure djs right and i don't know if that isn't a term pure dj but whatever it may be there is the same sort of divide where some people are looking at it thinking the ones that are like dominating the business side of things they're the ones that obviously get disproportionate the disproportionate amount of opportunities that probably is the issue right we can probably coexist the artist and the business people but it doesn't it shouldn't get to a point where the people that occupy the business side of things are getting all the opportunities and the ones that are on the artist side of things are getting none or they're getting, you know, they're having to fight over the scraps. That's what it, that's where it probably kind of falls by the wayside. But I still think it's funny watching it from the outside, seeing these guys skirt and dance around and be a bit awkward whenever Brendan Schultz comes around because his name comes up because unfortunately he is the, I won't say pet project, but he's basically, Joe Rogan is, is effectively taking him under his wing in some way shape or form right and i remember hearing a theory that the reason why was because ultimately joe rogan sort of feels guilty about that conversation they had that legendary conversation where joe rogan sits brendan Shaw down after i think he's lost to travis brown and essentially tells him hey you're not good enough for the ufc you'll never be champion and you need to quit now because if you keep going you're going to do yourself some serious damage and he basically said hey you've got the ability and the talent to do other things outside of fighting you don't need to do this and obviously brendan does some pushback which you know which he then relays the phrase you've been surprised and in reference to like i could do more you'll be surprised which then goes to you know name his ill-fated special that came out soon after on showtime but i remember reading a theory where someone said that supposedly joe rogan felt really guilty after that talk because it kind of you know he didn't for one moment he kind of forgot the cameras were recording he finally forgot where the setting was and he kind of felt as if he just had to say it in that moment but looking back he regretted doing that in public and maybe sort of like embarrassing his friend so he sort of went out of his way to make sure he opened as many doors as he could for him outside of fighting so that he could kind of you know um, readdress that karma or make himself feel better i guess in that respect so whenever it comes to brendan and stand up he's always going to kind of fight for him because he obviously feels guilty for putting him in that position where he has to do stand up in the first place because he told him to quit fighting so you know if he tells him that he's shit and he's never going to get better at doing stand-up comedy then what is the point of uh retiring from the um, ufc 
I guess, in that regard. Um, but who knows, man? Who knows? Uh, I still think, again, I don't find the guy funny. I find his podcast really funny. Um, I think that's okay. Um, I also think it's okay if you're a fan of his. I also think it's okay for people in New York who are, you know, story comics who have been in the game for 20 years to see someone like a Brendan Schaub, see him wearing expensive trainers, driving Porsches and stuff, and to feel a little bit jealous. I think jealousy and envy are all right are all right emotions, especially if they drive you to do something for yourself. I think if they kind of just push you to the direction of just gossiping and disparaging someone's name, that's when it gets a bit weird. But if you if it pushes you to kind of do your own thing, that's fine. But also I think it's fine to have some envy, just to look at it and think, how the hell can somebody be in a game for five years and be as on the surface richer or more successful than I am? It, you, you, you should be asking yourself some questions. You should be soul searching a little bit, but you shouldn't blame him for it. It's just unfortunately the nature of the game, isn't it? It's only normal that the people on the west coast of 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 america people that you know make their career specifically in the hollywood industry in la who are comedy store comics would necessarily be in the business side of things and i would know how to kind of exploit it um to its fullest potential and i don't think really think that's an issue really in my opinion next on the list what else do we have here to talk about to go through the list Talking about LA, talking about stand ups, and talking about everything that's going on at the moment. Joe Rogan is leaving and going to LA. You heard about that, right? Joe Rogan is leaving. Joe Rogan has left the building. This is old news, but I thought I'd talk about it here now with you guys. So, Joe Rogan's leaving LA. He's finally confirmed it. Rumors were swirling around the interwebs for a while because he did intimate a few things. If you listen to the Joe Rogan podcast for a while, you know he's always complained about the overpopulation in LA, the traffic issues, um, the homelessness problem. He's always kind of had a bit of an issue with it but the thing that's actually keeping him there especially when you consider um, the amount of resources that he has to just up sticks and go somewhere else is the comedy store and his circle of friends so recently he just decided i think off the back of the second lockdown in california or in la in california and the fact that they haven't really dealt with covid well there and there is no real prospect of them reopening uh the economy in la anytime soon and the fact that there was you know riots and protests going on all over the place he probably thought it was best time for him to up sticks and head off to texas um in order to kind of seek pastors new and maybe um you know birth a new scene there maybe open up a new club um whatever it may be um he's moving to la this is the article here from the blues it says um joe rogan host of one of the most popular podcasts on the planet um uh said that he decided to move to los angeles texas because he wanted a little bit more freedom rogan explained the decision behind his move during his podcast conversation with guest joe DeSena, the ceo and founder of spartan and the death race he says i'm out of here said rogan when joe DeSena asked him about moving he says i'm going to texas i want to go somewhere in the center of the country um somewhere it's easier to travel to both sides place to both places sorry somewhere where you have a little bit more freedom he says I also think that um, where we live right here in Los Angeles is overcrowded. And I think most of the time it's not a problem, but I think it's exposed in the fact that it's a real issue. And when you look at the number of people that are catching COVID because of this overpopulation issue, he says as well, when you look at the traffic and when you look at the economic despair, when you look at the homelessness problem that's accelerated radically over the last six, seven, ten years, I think there's too many people here. I think it's not it's not tenable. I don't think it's manageable and every mayor that does a shit job of doing it because I don't think anybody can do a great job of it. I think there's certain things you're going to have to deal with when you have a population of whatever fucking LA is, 20 plus million people. It's just too many people. It's just too many people. True. Um, I think I... I was um, a bit skeptical of this. I remember hearing him complain about this for a while, but then I had an ill-fated trip to LA when I went to go to the Golf Wang um, Festival in 2018. And bloody hell, just leaving the airport to get to downtown. Oh my God. And then downtown LA isn't like downtown in most places that you live in, in the United States, oh, that you would be... Uh, accustomed to the united states where that's kind of where all the bars and hangouts are downtown is basically where the homeless people kind of situate that's that's the kind of the derelict side of la it's really bizarre it's, it's a bit of a mind fuck but it took ages to get from la airport all the way until the hostel i was staying in um and then from there it took ages to get anywhere basically around la the only good thing about it at the time i remember is that even though there's a lot of traffic the ubers were ridiculously cheap i'm not too sure why maybe because it's a it's a driving city anyway so driving is a little bit of a commodity it's not as a big deal as it may be in other states but that was a big thing the food was flipping incredible but i did re i did actually see that especially when to, when you went out at night the 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 streets were packed with people packed with cars you know it was just an absolutely crazy place to live but 
of course, you know, if you're in the entertainment industry, being situated in LA, having everyone coming in for meetings and stuff is a great thing. I'm sure Joe's podcast has basically grown over the years, mostly due to his proximity of being in LA, even though I'm sure he flies in a few guests that he wants to get in. But for the most part, most people are going to LA to do meetings, to do promo. They can easily swing by your facility and have a two hour plus conversation. So he's taking a bit of, a bit of risk to go to Texas in that regard. But I also think it probably that isn't that big of a risk now considering the amount of people that are relocating there's a lot of conversations about people leaving densely populated urban environments and kind of going a little bit out of the city maybe you know an hour or two hours outside the vit just to kind of get a little bit more bang for their buck maybe to change of scene change of scenery maybe a change in career or maybe just a change in priorities right because some people are just basically saying hey i'm not going to work this 60 hour a week job working in this law firm i'm going to kind of reduce the hours a bit maybe volunteer or lend my services to a local council for four days a week making considerably less than I was doing but being a lot more happier because I got to spend time with my kids you get to spend time with your wife you get to spend time with your family whatever it may be right um, I think that's going to happen so a lot of people are going to be looking at places outside of their major city especially if you live in a major city and going somewhere else but I think COVID is either going to make you um, realize that you might need to move and get out of the city you're living in or it's going to make you really determined to take advantage of the city you live in right because for all the people leaving there's going to be a lot of empty spaces that you could also take advantage of. And I'm sure landlords are going to be desperate to get people in there because, you know, there's going to be hardly anybody moving in there. There's going to be no one coming down for university terms, no one coming in for Erasmus, no kind of uh, placements and all that sort of stuff that they get money from, no international students. Like, it's going to be a lot of income those those um, landlords are going to be missing out on. So interesting development to see. I want just to see how many other of those LA podcasters are also going to move. I haven't heard much from the, comedians in new york most of those guys are saying they're going to stay or most of what i've heard from those guys that they're going to move out to new jersey uh, but for the most part they're not really taking they're not really going that further out from where they are situated anyway so um yeah so let's see what happens man um let me just see how the podcast goes supposedly andrew Schultz said that he was, he's already got a facility that he's got in place which i'm sure he's just going to decorate because that's the thing that jorgen's funny about when he moved to this new facility he's got he just basically copied the same decor from his old podcast or new one he even the same table he got commissioned or i think it's from the same person the same curtain the same uh, flag at the back or behind him as well so he might do the same with the studio in texas as well or he might just keep both spaces and kind of cycle through them you know uh, do a batch recording of uh, la podcast with whenever the comedy store opens up who knows or he might open up his own comedy store that would be a big deal wouldn't it imagine that so let's move on from that one what else we want to talk about? Da, 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 da. Cause time is going. I don't always do much time. What else we have to talk about? I thought it was interesting. We've got some stuff about Spotify, some other stuff about Oh, actually, let's talk about this actually. This this is a big one. Um I think I no, do I owe Megan Megan the Stallion an apology or do we all owe her an apology? I think the whole internet does, right? So um Megan the Stallion got on social media the other day and essentially broke her silence regarding the problem or the issues or the kind of altercation she had allegedly with Tory Lanes that led to her being shot allegedly in both feet. Um, and, you know, from the onset, it didn't really look, it didn't really, it seemed quite fishy, right? No one could really get a gauge on what exactly happened because no, no kind of details came out. I guess partly due to the fact that it involved some high profile people in Kylie Jenner, Tory Lanes, alleged, well, Kylie Jenner allegedly, Tory Lanes we know specifically, um, and obviously Megan Thee Stallion, you know, you could argue between the three of them, they're worth billions in terms of streaming, in terms of endorsements, in terms of branding and business, all that sort of stuff. So it's within the it's within their it's within their team's interest to ensure that only a certain amount of news gets out there regarding the issue so that none of their business gets ruined because anything involving guns, anything involving a female, especially being mortally wounded or being wounded in any capacity, is definitely gonna never never is definitely going to negatively affect their pockets, right? Which kind of you know, which is really fucked up, really, because you know, I think any other person this happens to this this news gets blasted out all over the place. But the higher up, the higher up you are in terms of celebrity, the more well known you are, the more famous you happen to be, the more easier it is for you to kind of um, silence or kind of put the dampers on the story. So I was a little bit. 
skeptical of it people are making mm-hmm. their jokes online being funny about it which you know i think you should be allowed to do i don't think i think everyone being precious about oh you shouldn't say that because you know she's a girl and all that sort of stuff is it's fair but we don't know her you're allowed to make some jokes obviously if they're not funny they're not funny but you're allowed to make some jokes and kind of make fun out of it because we do that for everything and it just to bring some humor situation and sort of uh make it a little bit more easier to digest but when you watch this video of her kind of talking about it you do kind of think oh it's kind of even difficult even to make a joke regarding this issue because she clearly looks like she's going through it this is a instagram live taken or well, from making the silence instagram live where she sort of details exactly what happened uh well gives us a bit more detail on what happened and basically um <clears throat> kind of gives us some some context as to what she's kind of been going through these last couple of months play it for you now i was shot in both of my feet I was, I was shot in both of my feet and I had to get surgery to get the shit taken out, get the bullets taken out. Um, and it was super scary. Imagine shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Just, just imagine that. Imagine shooting this gorgeous girl. Imagine. What is wrong with you? What's going through your head? But obviously, observation looking wise, because obviously the picture she uploaded in her Fenty outfit was bloody, you know, sensational. But, you know, you can only look, it's only, you can only, it doesn't take a scientist to look at her or psychologist to look at her face and see that she's definitely hurting. She's definitely been through it, right? This is a very troubling ordeal that she had to kind of put herself through and she's still not kind of recovered from this ordeal that she had to go through with this, this supposed person. I do feel bad for making jokes now. Oh, Lord. I didn't think I was going to cry. <laughs> but, yeah. I had to get surgery. It was super scary. It was, like, just the worst experience of my life. <laughs> and it's not funny. There's nothing to joke about. Exactly. It was nothing for y'all to start going and making up fake stories about. <laughs> I didn't put my hands on nobody. I didn't deserve to get shot. I didn't do shit. Jesus. And thank God that the bullets didn't touch bones. They didn't break tendons. Like I know, I know my mama, my daddy, my granny had to be looking out for me with that one, cause where the bullets hit at, it just imagine, imagine being, imagine being 25. And you don't, you don't have both of your parents. My mama was my best friend. She, you know, I'm still really not over that. God damn. So you like, you kind of try to fill like your space with a bunch of people that you think is making you happy. Man, being famous sucks, isn't it? It really does, isn't it? For all the be- for all the benefits you get, right? The fame, the adulation, the money, the respect from your peers that you looked up to and your heroes and stuff. Fame itself is just, ugh. Having to deal with this stuff in public, pouring your heart out to your fans, having be, feeling obliged, because again, I wouldn't have done it if I was her, but she obviously feels some sort of obligation to explain to her fans that she's okay because she's probably getting inundated with DMs and messages from people, reaching out, making sure she's all right and stuff. But God damn it, man. Or just having to keep up appearances in general. Maybe it's a record label. To, I don't know, whatever. It's just annoying, right? You're, you went through a really traumatic experience. You're having to kind of really figure it out and come to grips with what exactly happened because we don't even know what happened. So she's probably having to figure out what happened, right? If we're confused, imagine how confused she is, right? One moment you're in a pool with Kylie Jenner in this iconic moment, everyone's like, wow, shit, she knows Kylie Jenner. Suddenly you're, you know, in some sort of altercation that results in both your feet getting shot. It's really a bit of a mindfuck. So you're having to process all of that whilst you're coming to grips with being famous anyway, right? She's only been famous, what, two or something years or something, right? And she's been in the public eye, like from, you know, in our collective consciousness. It's not a long time. Hey, it's hard to deal with, man. I feel, I feel, I've got a lot of sympathy for her. I really do, man. So a lot of things to deal with, but she looks like she's battling through. Looks like she's getting through it. Obviously, this is probably the. This is obviously. 
it's a sad thing to happen, but it's also a great thing because it definitely does show you who your actual friends are, right? More so than your seen friends. You get to understand, no, these are my actual friends because the ones that actually are riding for you are going to come down and sort of like support you because unfortunately it does involve some high profile people. So they're going to have to really decide who they are going to back. But the ones that are definitely in your camp are going to be in your camp forever and you're definitely going to find out who your ride or dies are. But God damn it, man, to go through this in public, it's, it's a lot in it. Especially as a young woman, as you said, it? But navigating through the industry without your parents, especially your mum who happened to be her cl best friend, as she mentioned, it's just like, ugh. I feel the sympathy for her, man. I really do feel for her, man. Um, so, yeah, um, thoughts and feelings go out to Megan. Hopefully she recovers in due course. And, yeah, people just allow her some time to kind of heal and repair and get to where she needs to get to in it because that's a lot to go through, isn't it? So, lastly, before we end the podcast here, I want to show you a pair of shoes or do a bit of preview on the shoes that I've been very, very excited about. Shoes that I'm actively looking forward to ever since I see, heard them being leaked or I heard the just, you know, when you get excited about shoe release, when you just see the color code, right? I didn't even know anything about it. I just saw the color code and saw the collaborator, Union LA, uh, a seminal streetwear a store that originally was founded in New York City by uh, James, J oh no, not found, was it founded by James Jebbia or was it? something that he kind of bought into the lady that ran it i'm not too sure the story i'm pretty sure he was working with union what was the story with union and james anyway james jb is associated with union it's a legendary streetwear store you know it's kind of um instrumental in being kind of the first maybe i would say english-speaking multi-brand store taking that concept that they had in japan specifically in tokyo and exported it, exporting it into the western world and essentially sort of built upon that now it's in the uh, it's now it's in the hands of chris gibbs who has essentially taken it to a next level as well really um uh, well done uh, buying decisions I guess in terms of the brands that they kind of uh, are involved in they've got a real good mix of high-end brands a real good mix of kind of you know DIY uh, back to basics brands as well and just kind of very tastefully done in their approach and their collaborations for the most part have been really good especially the collaborations they've done with Nike that Jordan 1 they put out first was really really special I thought um, because it did really look like a co it did look like an extension of their brand of their taste level of kind of what they represent and it was something that kind of stood out in terms of sort of like um, making its own mark in the crowded field of all these other Jordan ones that are out there so Union have announced another Jordan that they're going to put out it's a collaboration that they're doing with Jordan for the Jordan 4 one of my most favorite models maybe my most favorite model out there in terms of sneakers I've always said my top three sneakers in the world or top three sneakers ever I guess in the world ever would be um, Nike Air Max 1 no sorry Nike, Nike Air Max 90 uh, Jordan 4s and probably an Air Force 1. I would say they're my top three. If I didn't have to wear anything else ever, I'd just wear those three trainers. Um, they've, uh, I think two of them have been designed by Tinker Hatfield. Yeah, two, yeah. The Air Max 90 and the Jordan 4s. Uh, seminal, legendary um, Nike designer. If you don't know, do your Googles. But this is a detailed look at the Union and Air Jordan 4 pack that's coming out next month. You've got the black pair here, which I'm going to show you at the top which just looks fucking sublime. The material wise, I'm not sure if that's neoprene at the front, suede on the side, mesh, obviously netting. The tongue is a bit different. They've essentially, what it looks like, what they've done is that they basically turned the tongue um, back to front, right? So they've basically made the, the back of the tongue, uh, the front, and they basically tucked in the tongue at the behind. I'm not sure, maybe you can up, you can take it off as a bit of button there, I'm not too sure. The wings on the side have, haven't got the split on it, which I'm not sure if you can pop through. And whatever that neoprene or is not sure if it's Cordura on the side there, the same on this on the mesh toe box, just really sublime. And then you've got this entire yeah kind of what, what would you say, yellowy, um, peachy sort of looking color on the midsole with a red accent inside the bubble. I think they're just sublime, really. Um, this is an article here from Kicks Info. It says, Air Jordan Release Info it says, a recent leak from PY suggests that the Union Air Jordan 4 collaboration could be coming this fall um, in the form of two colorways below, although there's a strong chance they could be up a coming Union collab. It's still not confirmed yet, so just so stay tuned. But definitely our Union. I'm pretty sure I've seen that. There's no, um, yeah, because it's definitely got, it's got the Union LA tag here on the side as well. But two colors coming out, Jordan 4, Retro SP, both dropping on August the 29th, which is great. I wonder if they're going to be, oh, wow. One color, damn it. So the guava is a union only exclusive. Okay, so the black pair you're gonna get worldwide and the guava, which I really like. I actually prefer the guava, but it's so beautiful. It continues there. So check out the detailed look of them from GOAT. Like, look at that colorway. 
Jesus Christ, they're so nice. But they, they've, they're divided opinion online from what I've seen. People are kind of on the fence with them, but I think they're going to be similar to the Cactus Jack uh, Jordan 1s or, or similar to... What else was similar? There's a couple of other shoes like that, right? Where they got a bit of negative reaction online, but once they actually dropped, people got them on their hands. They were like, oh, they were convinced by them. And I think they'll be the same. Imagine how good these will look with fucking shorts on. Oh, so, so beautiful. It looks like what they've done, essentially, from looking at it outside in, it looks like they've essentially basically reversed or lifted up each panel. So the panel at the front, this sort of mud guard, has essentially been placed on top of this section as, as, our, as have these eyelets. So everything's sort of been lifted up. It's sort of been, you know, when you get, when you kind of blow up something, you deconstruct, so you've got that kind of stacked model and you kind of put it together the wrong way around. It kind of sit, looks similar to that. Um, or maybe similar to like, we know when they're designing them on the, sh on the, on the assembly floor when you haven't necessarily popped out some of the bits. That's maybe there's inspiration. But I'd like to know how, what the inspiration is behind them because bloody hell, the construction looks amazing. So, so beautiful. The shape looks great i actually don't mind the tongue the tongue obviously people don't like because it kind of reminds you of the um fake jordans people sell on those china rep sites right they sort of usually have the main fault you'd see on jordans is usually the tongue especially on the four the tongue is always a bit um jacked or messed up but i've had some retail jordan fours that i've got where the tongue has been a bit messed to be fair so i wouldn't necessarily say that's a good indication of knowing if your jordans are fake or not because i bought some from retail that you know the tongues have been all over the place but they look so bloody nice like look at them like wow and also it could be maybe a nod the tongue could be a nod to maybe skateboarding maybe you know back in the day when people used to have skate highs and they wanted to cut them into the shape of half cabs you just basically cut the color a bit of the color off maybe that is part of the inspiration or maybe it's just a practical thing they wanted jeans they wanted jordan fours you could wear with a pair of jeans i'm not too sure but i'm all for them and then you've got the red ass the kind of fusion guava essence at the back they look so beautiful so so beautiful that's maybe my favorite pair now considering having looked at them Maybe more so than the blacks. But the blacks are pretty decent too. And you know I'm a sucker for a black pair of shoes. But god damn it, they look good. God damn it. Two ninety a pair coming August twenty ninth, supposedly. One is world one is worldwide release in blacks and then the guavas are union only release. It's there, there's gonna be a lot of L's catch with these, but I'm definitely gonna be trying my best this. Definitely gonna be um trying my darn this, signing up to every single raffle that I can get my hands on to get a pair of these because they're so beautiful. I'm hoping that the negative reaction is gonna mean that there's gonna be less people vying for them in a raffle, so that means I can get a pair. I'm not sure if that's actually a thing in terms of probability. Does it mean if less people enter you can get a pair? I'm not too sure. Um it probably will increase your chances, I'm assuming. But I don't know. Um, if they're gonna backdoor some things, who cares really? You don't you never know, innit? People that worry about backdooring things, it's just who who cares? You 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 never find out. You're never gonna get the plugs. So just enter enter away, um, and see what happens, innit? But oh, so good. These are probably the only shoes I've I've wanted during the drops, apart from maybe the Travis Scott's um the Cactus Jack uh, what you call it um Trail right the Air Max twenty what Air Max two seventies or whatever they are. These are probably the only ones I've wanted during this whole drop season during COVID, man. These are so beautiful. Look at them. Oh, I'm all over them so much. I can't wait for them to come out. So yeah, August 29th, um, Union and Air Jordan 4s. Um, if you're going to get a pair, definitely let me know what you think. What's your favorite color? Which one are you waiting to get? I'm definitely down for the guavas more so. Um, it's a f unfortunate that they're Union only exclusive, but if I have to settle for the blacks, I will settle for them easily. But let me know in the comments, which color are you going to go for? Guava or black? Oh, mate so good so so good but yeah that's it for now thank you so much for tuning in to excellent english episode number 348 if it's your first time listening of course make sure you leave me a five star review on the podcast app and share that show with your friends if you're watching via the youtube show make sure you click that um, subscribe button make sure you smash that like button and leave me a comment down below let me know what you think of it and of course if you can extend yourself to support the show if you can do um please support me on patreon it's for one dollar only one dollar on patreon link is down below patreon.com for just agostino support me on patreon you can get the show ahead of time two days sometimes three days ahead of time on audio format via patreon and until then i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe enjoy your weekend and see you on the other side peace bye bye bye